if you're a hobbyist programmer, you'll probably know what it's like to, you know, go through the whole process of writing a program and then testing it. You usually test your program in what I would consider a pretty intuitive, a pretty unguided manner. You just basically walk through the program and see if it works. But have you ever wondered how testing is done on larger scale projects? You know, for example, an operating system like Windows? We wouldn't expect them to actually walk through the program bit by bit to try and look for errors. So how is it done? We talk about all this and more in today's Random Wednesday episode. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. Now, as you can imagine, testing is an extremely important part of any development process. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some of the principles that go into formal testing, and we're going to take a look at how larger projects actually make use of these principles. We're going to look at some ways of rigorous testing. We're going to see how exactly it works and what scopes it exists at. So today's video will be a lot of talk, a little bit of examples, but I think it should be interesting if you haven't been exposed to this sort of information before. So yeah, let's jump right in. First and foremost, let's give a name to what we've been doing intuitively. In fact, what we normally do, you know, when we are writing our own little programs, is called exploratory testing. As its name implies, we're just exploring. We're just, you know, sort of moving our way through the program and try to see if we can find any bugs. Obviously, there are some pros and cons to this method. The advantages being that, well, it's simple and easy to do. You can do it as long as, you know, you're the one who's written the program, you'll know where to go, what to look out for. This also helps in the sense that the obvious bugs, those things that are immediately visible from the point of view of a user, can be found very quickly, because you are essentially putting yourself in the shoes of a user. Some disadvantages of this method could be difficulty in reproduction, that is, you may have done a whole bunch of things to lead up to a bug that maybe later on you wouldn't be able to reproduce exactly, and as a result, the bug actually disappears or the conditions around it change. So there is always a lot of uncertainty regarding bugs found in this manner. And secondly, there isn't a lot of coverage. In formal terms, coverage is defined as how many lines of code you are actually able to test. When we're doing exploratory testing, we might miss out areas of code. You know, we might miss out entire operations. And as a result, areas of code just don't get tested. We lose out on coverage. So yeah, knowing why exploratory testing isn't great, let's take a look at some fundamentals on actual rigorous testing methods. And actually, the first thing we want to quantify is what we are actually doing in the first place. You know, what's the objective of testing? As it turns out, really the intention of testing is to make sure that the program actually conforms to requirements and expectations. That's it. And that is what you've been subconsciously doing as you're doing exploratory testing. So with an understanding of this, you know, key principle, we can move on to see how larger scale projects actually do testing. As it turns out, they actually do testing using an automated method. So how do you test your expectations using an automated method? Turns out it's very simple. You take a chunk of code, be it a function, be it a class. Basically, you expect it to take some input and produce some output. So all you have to do is to construct some input in which you know what kind of output it will produce, throw this input at the code and look at what output it produces. Compare it against the output you've expected and if they match, everything is working fine. If they don't, your expectations are being violated and that indicates a bug somewhere. The key to writing good automated tests is simply in changing that input to you know, take into account as many cases as possible. For every piece of code, we'll want to try several different inputs on it. We want to make sure that good input is accepted. We want to ensure that you know, bad input is rejected. We want to ensure that inputs at a boundary of good and bad are being handled appropriately. And finally, we want to make sure that completely invalid inputs don't crash your system. Your system is able to you know, show some kind of error, but 
doesn't actually accept the value. Software packages exist out there to make your life easier when you're doing automated testing. Basically, it makes setting up and tearing down much easier. It can also provide some kind of interface to show you how many tests have been run, how many have passed, how many have failed, and where the issues are. What you're seeing on screen right now is a test package called JUnit running within the Eclipse IDE. And yeah, as you can see, it takes one click to start the unit tests. Everything is run, it tells you how many tests have passed and how many have failed. This makes it very easy for you to do your testing. You can do testing very often and you can catch issues early, which is always nice. Now, testing exists on several scopes. We can do what is known as unit testing and that works in a system that can be modularized. What that means is we can actually break our system down into little components and what we want to do is we want to test just each one of these components on their own. That's what the term unit means, in the words unit testing. Generally, when we're performing unit testing, we want to make sure that we are only looking at that unit itself. We don't want to actually take into account any possible issues from other sources. So what we do is for all the other modules that this particular unit under test is communicating with, we want to replace them with stubs. Instead of running their full logic, we just replace them with something simple. That way, we eliminate all sources of error except for within that unit under test itself. This of course makes finding issues much easier because we can just, you know, home in on the unit itself. So that was unit testing. And while that is great, eventually we'll want to make sure that all these individual units can play nice with each other. This is when we move on to what is known as integration testing where we actually test several of these modules together. Of course, it's probably not advisable to do this before we've done thorough unit testing, but once we're sure that all the individual units are working fine, we can test the whole lot together, and if we find any issues, we can be reasonably confident that it lies in the communication between those modules, as opposed to the modules themselves. Now, while automated testing is great, you know, it makes things much faster, it's very easy to use, we have to be aware of one basic pitfall, and that is the fact that automated testing doesn't help us find new bugs. All it can do is to make sure that things actually conform to our expectations. Nothing more, nothing less. If we test often during the development phase, all we're doing is guarding ourselves against what is known as regressions. Regressions refer to, you know, when something is right originally and then, you know, you do something later on that breaks it. This is when our original expectations, which were once fulfilled, now become violated. We want to make sure that that doesn't happen, which is why we keep testing to make sure that, you know, everything is working as we expect. But that's it. That is the limitation of, you know, automated testing. And if we want to actually find bugs that come up from use, we'll actually have to use the program. We'll have to perform exploratory testing of some kind. Now, we're almost done here, but I do want to bring up some related terms that may interest you. The first of which is security testing. Security testing is an interesting way of doing automated testing on a program, but as its name implies, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that our program is secure. One interesting way in which this is done is actually by what is known as fuzzing. Fuzzing is when you actually just throw a lot of random input at some kind of input area, you know, like a fob, and we want to make sure that the program is able to gracefully handle this. So what you're seeing here is the login form of one of the projects I've worked on in the past. It's being bombarded by just randomized inputs. You know, it's just a little auto hotkey script I've written to do that. And yeah, as long as the program holds up, you know everything is working fine. The whole reason why we are using randomized strings instead of something that we've set is because, well, whatever we set is something we've expected. So this is actually testing against things that we cannot imagine, it's things that is completely randomized and not expected. And the program still needs to work under these conditions. Here's another testing related term, test driven development, also known as TDD. Now, TDD actually gives us a very different perspective on, you know, the workflow of writing a program. It basically says that we can only write code in response to failing unit tests. What this means is at the very beginning to even start, you need to write a test first. 
then watch it fail, and then write code to address it until it passes. And write no more code than that, the next thing you want to do involves creating another unit test. So this is very interesting because it actually puts testing first. You want to make sure that everything you write has a corresponding unit test to back it up. It's a very interesting approach to writing programs. I've got to confess I've never really done serious TDD before, but it looks like a very good practice and looks like something that, you know, you should do if you want to be very sure that your program will work right. So yeah, that is basically today's episode. We've packed in a lot of information, so hopefully it wasn't too much. Hopefully it was useful and it gave you some insights. But that's it. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.